Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, let's get going. Uh, today we're going to talk about getting our DNS as a service to production uh, using Designate. Uh, I'm Matt Fisher. Um, this is Eric Peterson. We're both principal engineers at Time Warner Cable and work on the OpenStack team. Um, Clayton O'Neill could not join us today. He actually did a lot of this work, so I want to leave his name and contact info up here. Uh, today, basically, what we're going to talk about is starting from investigations, how we, have de how we got de Designate running in production today. A little bit of background. Um, we typically were providing infrastructure as a, infrastructure as a service, we're giving people VMs, right? But the most requested feature we got was self-service DNS. Before we had designate, the process was manually go file a ticket, someone on our team manually go add the entry. It didn't scale, and it was annoying, and engineers don't really like to work on tickets or do manual processes like that. Um, well, a little, another little piece of background, we use VXLAN-based private tenant networks. Um, so this means we want to attach uh, records to floating IPs when they're uh, associated. And we also share a single DNS namespace across both our regions. We also share the same namespace with a VMware infrastructure cluster so that customers can use the same, um, the same domain regardless of which type of infrastructure they're running on. So how do you get started with Designate? Uh, first, you watch all the Summit videos um, from Atlanta. Um, and uh, once you do that, you hop in the IRC channel and you ask Kyle and uh, the other guys there a ton of questions and just bother the heck out of them usually. Um, what this, um, as this came out, um, Kilo was still in heavy development. We actually asked, you know, should we just go ahead and use Kilo? And we were told, absolutely not. Um, <laughs> it's not ready yet. So th all this talk today is based on Juno. Um, oh, we'll, we'll talk about Kilo here at the end. Um, we read a ton of docs. And during this process, we learned that PowerDNS backend was one we wanted to use, just from a use point of view and a testing point of view. Um, we also kind of decided at the time about how we're going to do the architecture here across our multiple regions and have the shared, uh, shared domain space. I'm going to give you a brief, brief overview of what the architecture of Designate looks like. Uh, this is a zoomed in version. This is one control node in one region. Um, we have multiple regions and multiple control nodes per region, but just for simplicity's sake, we're going to show this. Um, if you look at, the, um, look at the designate API box here, kind of in the middle, uh, this is where all the REST requests come in. Um, we front this two ways. For internal requests and Horizon, we front it with HAProxy. Uh, for external requests from customers or CLI kind of things, we front it with an A10 hardware load balancer. Um, further to the right, you'll see a designate central box. This is where all the heavy lifting of designate um, occurs. Um, this is where all the database uh, things happen, where all the data is stored. And in our case, we're using a cross-region Galera cluster to store this data because we want the um, database records uh, shared across both regions since the domains are shared across both regions. Um, central DNS also hosts all the power DNS backend code. Um, and any communication between the API and this happens through a RabbitMQ uh, message service. Uh, you'll see a PowerDNS box as well. Uh, PowerDNS is what serves up the domain data. Um, it's configured to use a, its own MySQL database, and Designate Central keeps this up to date, um, basically keeps these two databases in sync. PowerDNS also see has a connection to InfoBlox. Uh, we are using InfoBlox to um, basically serve our external facing DNS, so it made sense to sort of make this connection here and have InfoBlox basically secondary the DNS data from PowerDNS. Finally, in the middle, um, something we're going to talk a lot about today is a sync. Um, the designate sync is something that essentially listens for Neutron and Nova events and then takes action on them. So the kind of events we're interested in is somebody associated a floating IP or somebody disassociated. When those events happen, we want records to be created automatically so that customers don't have to go in and cl click a button and create a record. If they spin up a VM and associate an IP, they get a record. That, that would be our goal. OK, Eric. Yeah, so uh, delving into a little bit more about the uh, groundwork to get Designate running in our environment. Uh, one of the first things that we needed to work on was uh, puppet work. So a lot of our infrastructure is deployed via puppet. So one of the first things to do is to go out to the Puppet community, the OpenStack uh, Puppet modules, and, and look at them and kind of take a, take a peek at them. So we started with that. Um, and then we kind of realized that uh, we couldn't get a uh, designate package that was uh, available from uh, Canonical at the time that we were ready to go with. So what we did 
in addition to that, we were also going to be running this on our control nodes. And anytime you're adding a service to a control node that, for the most part, is stable, um, you want to kind of be careful how many things you're changing, adding, doing things like that. So what we did is we decided to deploy designate in a virtual environment. Uh, and so right now this work uh, to have Puppet deploy designate through a Python virtual environment. It's a local patch that we're holding. We're curious to see how other people react to it. We're welcome to, uh, to share this information, share this approach with others. But it's, it's not something that maybe the entire Puppet deployment community is ready for all of that maybe yet. Uh, the other area that we wanted to work in uh, uh, to add some more, uh, a little bit more polish around was the, the UX, so the designate plugin for Horizon. Our end users kind of vary in skill levels. Some of them might be very familiar with setting up their own DNS records. Some of them might just say, I've got a VM. I, I need a pretty name to go with an IP address. Could you please just make things simple for me? So uh, another aspect that we looked at was uh, policy enforcement changes. So within uh, Horizon, you can see up above, I've got like an admin user. They can create a domain, delete a domain. We're really trying to isolate what our customers see, what, it, what they have access to for Designate. So we've added policy enforcement to the Designate uh, Horizon plugin. So down below is what, what a more typical user for our Designate service would see. They don't have the ability to create their own domain. Uh, just one more example of uh, some more policy support. You can see DNS shows up uh, on the left-hand side. It does not show up on the right-hand side. We're doing this through uh, keystone roles. So if we grant a keystone role for DNS to a particular tenant or a particular user in a tenant, then they'll have this DNS feature show up within Horizon. So taking this approach enabled us to kind of have a limited beta and have a service that's out there in production, but not expose it to every single one of our users just yet. So it enables us to kind of work out some of the kinks and uh, kind of control who has access to it early on. Uh, another thing that we changed was the, uh, the ability to, to create a record. The screen on the left was a little bit uh, harsh maybe for some of our customers. So we've softened that up a little bit. Uh, you can see like when you want to create a record, like some people will know what an A record is and they'll be like, oh, that makes sense. Some people will say, what, what's, what's an A record? or quadruple A or whatever. Um, so we've kind of simplified some of that stuff. We've added some extra um, air handling and messaging for end users when they don't create the, they don't use the right format for the name, some additional information like that. Uh, some other things that we needed to consider for uh, rolling designate out to uh, production was we needed to figure out how we were going to limit things to, uh, to, our, to our end customers. What, what um, domain were they all going to, to share and live off of? Uh, we also had to, to kind of go through and provide some, some documentation to end customers to say, uh, these new folks that we're going to be bringing on, what can we set for the right level of expectations for them? DNS as a service was a little bit kind of a, a new concept for some of our customers. So we had some documentation to work through. Also, we're working with uh, info blocks, and we had to write a little bit of our own custom um, synchronization code or our own kind of registration code to keep info blocks happy with what Designate thought the state of the environment was. So rolling out Designate, our schedule, where we are. So we've got uh, limited use in April. It was really when we started. Uh, as I said before, we've got uh, usages controlled through uh, keystone roles. Uh, so you have to have this certain uh, designate role to be able to use, uh, to use it. Uh, we've got the designate sync beta starting kind of after the summit. And really right now, uh, uh, we use a, a tool called Node Pool. And it, it runs within our production cloud. And it spins up hundreds of VMs all the time. And right now, that's a, that's a tool that we use to help support some of our CI CD infrastructure. But it's using uh, Designate right now. So when it stands up instances, it's really creating a lot of records, tearing them back down. So eating our own dog food in this case has helped us kind of flush out to make sure that, that it's going to work in a reasonable way. Uh, we're looking for general availability here in the next month. Uh, a lot of that depends upon our upgrade to the Kilo schedule. We'll look at Kilo. There's some changes with Kilo that are coming up. And we're kind of looking forward to that. Uh, but also upgrading all of our other infrastructure to Kilo is no small feat. So we're going to have to kind of watch how these efforts um, track for timeline. So what we offer to our, to our end customers, what, what do they see? 
So right now they get get their own domain there. You can see it's right now it's a tenant. So whatever their tenant name is .cloud .twc net. We've talked about giving them the, the power to be able to choose their own domain. So we, we might be able to do that. So instead of tenant, you might be able to have an arbitrary uh, name that you would like. Uh, the CRUD operations on the actual records, they're going to be allowed. Uh, the CRUD operations on the, the domains, they are not allowed. And so you can see that in that earlier screen where I couldn't see the create domain button. Um, and we're doing that because just all the synchronization we need to do with uh, info blocks and keeping everything in sync and making sure uh, all the DNS infrastructure components are all in agreement was a little bit, it became extra complicated for us and it wasn't something we were ready to kind of bite off on you just yet. So <coughs> what would a customer see? So this is, I'm going to kind of show through an example here. So this is me logged in uh, to Horizon. You can see I've got uh, three instances there. I've got an instance named DB, and I've got two instances named Web Server. All three of these instances have a floating IP address. And if you go up at the top, you can see that I've got a project. My project, or tenant, is called Eric's-stuff. So it's not very, you can tell that the <laughs> developer did that. <laughs> yeah. So what would I see? If I've got, if I've got this information, what would I see for my DNS records? This is what you would see. So the interesting thing here, or the thing to point out here, is I had two instances in Nova called web server. So how do you resolve that, that problem? So the first instance will get web server.ericstuff.cloud.twc.net. He'll get his IP. The DB one, that of course will get its own as well. But then the ability to um, disambiguate or to kind of clarify when we've got co collisions, we use the, the floating IP address, except we use it with dashes. And that's how we give that, that extra web server instance its own domain name. That's the policy we use. So with that. OK. Uh, so tools and monitoring is something I worked on uh, for Designate. And so I want to talk to you about what you might have to do for this. Uh, first, testing. We have a standardized test framework that we use. Um, I wrote some smoke tests for this. This is basically, is designate working? Can you create a record? Is it resolvable? Um, the stress test is an extension on this. Let's blast designate. Let's just create like thousands of records simultaneously, deleting them. Um, and let's see what happens. Um, basically, is designate going to blow up when this goes out to production? It's in heavy use. Um, when we did this, we found that it was taking a while to get some of the records to be resolvable. Uh, we found that Pirate DNS has a refresh option set to a few minutes, I think. So we have it set to every five seconds so that when a record was created, um, it would get out, uh, refreshed out to info blocks very quickly. Um, we had some basic timing with this. We found 80% of the records were resolvable within 10 seconds. Uh, within 20 seconds, it was 98%. And by 30 seconds, they were all resolvable. Um, those are just rough numbers, but when is my record going to be resolvable is a customer every quest a question every customer asked us all the time. So we wrote all these great tests and um, we found problems. The first one is when you try to create and delete thousands of records at the same time, the database deadlocks. Um, your API call will time out after 60 seconds and you look in the log and it says the database is deadlocked. Um, I believe this is fixed in kilo. Um, we don't think we're going to run into this product in run into this in production, except possibly with the sync. Customers going into the GUI and making a record, that's not going to be tens of thousands of those going on at the same time. Um, when we saw the deadlocks, we started diving into the database, and there's a concept in there of records and record sets. The problem we found was there was record sets without records, and um, things seemed to be out of sync. Um, we talked to Kyle, and apparently this is a normal situation or a known issue, and it's not something to worry about. Uh, we did see a second database problem, which is something to worry about. So Designate has a database, PowerDNS has a database. When those two get out of sync, uh, for example, the record's gone from Designate, but it's still present in PowerDNS, you now have a name entry that, de that Designate doesn't know about. Um, so for, the, for these database problems, we actually wrote Isinga monitoring to go look for them. I mean, it would be probably easy to just have Isinga also just fix them, um, but we want to kind of see the scale of the problem first. Um, and to my knowledge, uh, in production, we've not seen the orphaned record sets. It was only when I was stressing it quite heavily. Um, so what do we do for monitoring? We use Isinga, as I mentioned. We run basic API checks. Is the API responding on the VIP and on the nodes? 
Um, we do the database monitoring that I mentioned. In the future, I would like to know, um, for all the records Designate has, are they actually resolvable? Because there's a couple pieces in this chain. There's uh, Designate, PowerDNS, and Infobox. And anywhere along the way that chain breaks, the record's not usable anymore. Uh, finally, for the sync, you know, sync's creating deleting records all the time. You can have an issue where you have a floating IP that doesn't have a record, and you can have a record that doesn't have a floating IP. I'd like to know when those things happen so that we can clean them up. So at this point, I'm going to go into the sync handler. You can run designate without a sync. The, the point of the sync is automatic record creation. Your customers might be fine just going in the horizon and doing this. The sync is a pretty important feature just because it simplifies things for them. They automatically get a record. They don't have to think about it. An overview of a sync, what a sync is. A sync listens to events from Nova or Neutron, registers handlers for them, and does things based on you know, what handlers it registers. Um, the configuration is done on a per handler basis. So what were our requirements for a sync? Um, this might be different depending on if you're using Nova Network, Neutron, or whatever, but basically when a uh, floating IP was created or deleted, we wanted to create or delete a record. The records had to go in the tenant domain as we've discussed before, and we should base these on the instance name as Eric showed you, so web server becomes web server dot with the fallback rule if we already have a record of that. Um, we wrote this code to support multiple tenant domains, although we don't currently use it. And we wanted the na names to be flexible so that um, if you don't like your DNS records being Eric's-stuff, you could possibly set it to be something else. So the code is flexible, although we don't currently use that feature. So how do you get started with a sync? Um, we started with the Neutron sync handler. It does everything based on floating IP addresses, which is how we got our great idea for the fallback name. Um, puts everything in a single domain, not a domain per tenant. It doesn't handle instance metadata, which is an important thing that we found out later was good to have, but it was a good basis to start. Um, we also, uh, just for completeness' sake, dug into the NovaSync handler, but since we're using Neutron, we didn't get useful events out of it that we would need for associating floating IPs. So as I said, we started by forking, forking the Neutron handler. We took the handler, we wrote a CLI wrapper around it, so that instead of putting it out there and like waiting for events to come in, we could just exercise it by telling it a floating IP was associated. Go, go do what you need to do, and let's see what happens. Initially, uh, this was calling into the designate rest, rest API, and again, we were using a Juno target for this. So how do you write a sync handler? Well, you start by looking at all the messages Neutron sends out, and there's, there's lots of messages. And you figure out which messages are going to be useful. Um, once you get those messages, you look at the payload and you say, given this information in this event, which I'm going to show you here in a minute, how can I get all the data I need to create instance name dot tenant name dot cloud dot tbc dot net? Um, what we found when we did this is associating a floating IP was great. The event had a ton of information in it. But when we started doing disassociate um, or deletes, things got to be a problem. Now this here is an actual payload from Neutron. Um, when an associate event comes in, and I'm going to talk through it in a minute. First thing you need to know before we get into this, Neutron sends out events at the beginning and end of a CRUD operation. But the event that goes out at the beginning, the start event, happens whether or not the event succeeds. So you could get an associate start event that might not succeed. So you, you can't use that event. Um, you have to use the end event, because you know then that it actually went through. Um, the other thing is, uh, we couldn't find any documentation on any of these events. So, um, we just kind of watched these and read them and thought those fields look kind of useful and let's see what happens. Um, this is a payload specifically for a floating IP update end event. Um, this goes out after a successful associate event happens. We know it's successful because we have a fixed IP address and a floating IP address in here. Um, the other interesting thing here is the port ID. Uh, this is the port ID of the Neutron port associated to the instance. So. From this information, though, we need to find the instance name because that was our strategy for naming this, this thing. So what we do is we take, we query Neutron for the device ID associated with the port ID, and we can take that information and get the instance UUID and then go ask Nova what the name is. I had to read the notes on that one. It's a little complicated. It's simple. <laughs> <laughs> we would love for this payload to be so, have everything in it, but not a choice. Okay. So what happens with the disassociate event? You remember we can only use the end because the start may fail. 
The problem is after the end event, is the, it's disassociated. So all the really cool fields we were using are now null. Um, so what we did at first was we take this tenant ID and we go query designate and we'd walk, look through every record and try to find something that matched. Um, this was a reasonable workaround, but it's not very efficient. Um, so at this time, uh, we started digging into the records database a little bit, and we found a bunch of fields called managed. Um, and then so started digging the source code, trying to figure out what these fields are. And it turns out that, that these managed fields looks like you can use to track metadata inside, inside designate using the RPC API. So at this point, we basically scrapped most of the code um, and started using the designate RPC API. We hadn't used it originally because it's not documented. And so we thought it might be, might be really hard to use. It turns out it's actually way more flexible. Remember before I said we took the tenant ID and we had to search every record? Well, using these managed fields like manage resource ID, you can, you can do a query. Find me every record that has this you know, key value pair that matches. And so that the search was much more uh, flexible and much more efficient. Um, this ended up being a way better way to disassociate floating IPs. There's one last problem. I mentioned we check for associate and disassociate events. When you delete a VM, you do not get any floating IP events. You get a port delete event. This is the sum total of the useful information that you get in the event. So now we have this, and we need to go delete a record. So how do you do this? Well, the fortunate thing is, again, we used a managed, um, managed extra field. And we just match this port ID into a record we've put into designate. And without this, we actually had no way um, to solve this problem. OK, so the sync's getting complicated at this point. So let's break it down, because there's only four actual steps that the sync does. Um, step one, um, this is when, the, when your VM goes away. If you get a port delete end event, Find a record and designate and remove it. That's pretty simple. Step two, if you get a floating IP update end or delete end event, then we go delete the record. So this is interesting, because the floating IP update event could also be an association happening. But just for code simplicity, we just go ahead and delete the record, delete any related records anyway, and then we go immediately create them. Um, this just ensures that if we've somehow gotten out of sync, maybe we can um, we can get those records deleted before we go re-add. So this is the deletion. Step three, this is the creation. If it's an update end and it has a fixed IP address and floating IP address, um, let's go try to find what domain we should be using based on the tenant. Let's go get all the instance information, which is the name, and let's make an A record uh, following the pattern Eric talked about before. Step four also matches what Eric said. If the, if the record creation fails, uh, because there's already something there called my instance, um, then we basically fall back to using this floating IP address dashed format. So the step, the sync works. It's running in production now with node pool, um, but there are some problems with it. Um, cleaning up these managed records is a pain. Um, if you wanted to do this in Juno, you, uh, you uh, set a policy JSON file, and then you made curl calls. Um, which is obviously so much fun to do. Um, however, I think Clayton harassed Graham Hayes enough, and uh, if Graham's in the audience today, and this uh, feature to, uh, to change uh, managed fields was added to the CLI, um, I, th I think for Liberty, possibly. Uh, you don't want users to be able to delete managed records, because managed records also include like your DNS servers and your SOA records. You don't want customers messing with those. The next thing is if the sync fails in any way along here, leaving a record behind, failing to create a record, users have no idea because the sync is completely transparent to them. So what they'll do is they'll file a ticket with us saying, I don't have a record, what's going on? We'll have to go dig in the logs. Um, also, the name conflict, instance dash floating IP, does, that doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to anyone. Our customers are never going to realize, oh, yeah, that's a real obvious name. It would be easier just to use IP addresses if that's the DNS record you're going to give me. Um, so yeah. Um, finally, uh, we really want to get reverse IP lookup support in here. I know if I was a customer and, I, and I, my record wasn't working, um, I might do a reverse lookup on my floater and see, like, oh, you gave me a different record or something. I think there's support in this, uh, designate for this, but we just haven't uh, implemented it yet. 
Uh, finally, Eric showed you a bunch of Horizon screens, instance name, IP address. Why not the domain name? That would be great. That's something our customers want. OK. So this whole big section about the sync, um, this is all public code. It's on GitHub. Um, we mirror this from our internal Garrett. So what you see on GitHub is what we're, what we're deployed to production with right now. Um, we'd love to get patches on this. If you send us a patch and it's a good patch, I promise we'll take it. Um, and uh, also feedback or comments. We have a great readme there. Um, it's not completely TWC specific, even though we, we've made these rules about uh, domain per tenant and that kind of thing. We've tried to make the code flexible so that other people can use it. Yeah, so what's up? Uh, what, what's, what are we looking forward to? One of the main things that we're looking forward to as we, we look towards the future, really, uh, this is the um, architecture we're looking forward to. And a lot of this looks very similar. The one thing is the uh, lower right-hand section is a designate mini DNS. And we're looking forward to that because that's going to make the synchronization with power DNS and designate. It's going to resolve a lot of those issues where you've got a simplified version of what should be reality. Uh, and so looking, looking forward, we really look to this, uh, this new architecture in Kilo. And about Kilo, we plan to migrate as soon as possible. Obviously, when you're trying to upgrade your, all your OpenStack infrastructure, upgrading to a new version is not always the, the quickest thing. It um, usually uh, provides plenty of excitement for you. So we're, but we're trying to do that as soon as we can. Uh, obviously, as I just said, we're excited for the uh, mini DNS uh, and the uh, transaction retry, retry support. Uh, right now, we're working on migration plans. Actually, Clayton right now is actually looking at uh, a lot of the migration work. Uh, we're also looking for uh, a better integration with our Infoblox components. Uh, Infoblox right now, they have a prototype designate driver available, uh, and they're also looking for uh, tighter integration with uh, Neutron and Designate. So with that, I hope uh, that everybody got a little bit of insight into what it takes, or at least what it took us to get Designate running in, uh, in our limited production, almost full production at uh, Time Warner Cable. Uh, finally, we'd like to thank uh, Cal McKennis and uh, Graham Hayes, everybody in the OpenStack DNS channel, uh, and all the support that the, that the community's been able to provide us to help us roll this out. With that, I don't know if there's any questions. And a lot of times, you go up to the microphone, I think, is what they prefer. <laughs> Except maybe Dave might be loud enough. <laughs> I believe it was written to support that, yes. In the sync, yeah. In the sync, yep. Um, that would take some reconfiguration and stuff, but customers have asked about basically bring your own domain or bring your own subdomain. Um, and customers have also said, when I made this tenant called whatever, I didn't expect you to call my domain that. So can you give me something different, even if it's a domain per tenant? Give me a better name for my domain. Um, so that's also something we like to do. But the goal is to get a minimally viable product out see how people use it, see what complaints people have, and then roll it from there. Yes? That's my understanding, yes. Yep. Can we please use the microphone? Oh, can you go to the mic? Please, microphone. All right. So the first question was, does the um, domain sync problems go away when mini DNS replaces power DNS? And the answer is we think, we believe so. We believe so. so. Yeah. How many how many SQL Alchemy calls are left in the code? Oh, I I actually well the, the reason we're asking that obviously is because when you're making the DNS or excuse me you're making the SQL queries and not just I saw I really appreciated you saying hey by the way use the RPC the project has on there and don't make the database calls yourself if you can avoid it because that's the migration issue right yep but are you still doing have you have you committed to moving all towards using the the RPC callbacks? In the sync handler, it's mm -hmm. completely RPC now. Yep, the sync handler for yeah. sure. Yep. Um, so I was curious as to why you didn't do use just like Debian packaging or something like that with like why you used why you decided to go with virtually and be. 
So there's two reasons. The first reason was when we started, there was no um, Ubuntu packages for this. They came out in mid-April for Kilo, um, I think, at the time. Um, that's, that's number one. Number two, I think in general, and this is another discussion, um, we're really interested in looking at virtual environments. There's something to be able to more isolate our services. You know, Eric runs Horizon off master, um, and he can upgrade that without breaking everybody else. If Eric drops Horizon on there, or, or another service, and a bunch of dependencies, you're going to cause problems with libraries. It's the typical packaging problem. Um, Designate was also perfect for testing out how we might get a Puppet module to support virtual environments because um, it, it, it really, was new. It's right? new. Yeah. It doesn't have a lot of use. Doesn't have a lot of development activity. So that was a, a good test bed for us. Um, my other question was: um, so the Horizon UI changes or the UX changes? Did you did you guys do that yourself, or were you pulling that from somewhere? Yeah. So uh, as background, I've spent a, f a few years as a Horizon developer, and so all the changes that we made, we contributed back to the community, and we continue to work with them to try to figure out, you know, can we improve it a little bit more? Can we add this, that, or the other thing? Great, thanks. Yep. Hey, uh, do you have any plans for IPv6 support? Like uh, it's probably something we're looking into. We haven't specifically discussed it in terms yeah. of designate. I see somebody in the audience who's like wincing or smiling. I'm not sure with that question. That, you, yeah. that guy right there is going to do it for us. Yeah. So I had a question here. Um, uh, so is uh, uh, is so I saw in your architecture diagram that you have a Galera cluster. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So so it's basically to have just one DNS infrastructure across all your regions. Right. So yeah. we have a global identity uh, system. So Keystone uses already sort of this global Galera cluster. And if we have a um, tenants thereby are are global, okay. right? So therefore, if we're doing a tenant per domain or domain per tenant, designate also from a database point of view should be global, um, and that was the decision we made. Okay. So and uh, so is your Power DNS still local? Because Power DNS also has a MySQL database. No, it's all. I believe it's also replic replicated. Yeah. Oh, okay, so, it's a, so that's also a cluster. Wait, I'm sorry. No, it's not. It runs on the um, control nodes. So it's oh, it not replicated. On. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. Okay, and one more question I add, had is uh, when you, uh, with the port delete, uh, when you send a port delete message and when you could designate consumes it, um, doesn't it do a reverse lookup? Doesn't it try to do a reverse lookup to find uh, the PTR record and delete it as opposed to going through the database? I mean, I didn't understand that part. We take that um, the port ID uh -huh. that comes out of the delete, okay. and we have saved that into a managed extra field in Designate's uh -huh. database. So uh -huh. we just take, we just query and say, find me all records that match. This all e eight records. Yeah, That's and right. then and then delete them. Delete those records okay. if you find them. Yeah. Otherwise, okay. you'd really kind of be out of luck because you'd get a port delete, and you'd have to look up what what device was this port attached to, mm -hmm. and at that time it might be gone. So you're really not sure what's going on at that point. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a uh, good introduction. Uh, and um, my question is, uh, does uh, DesignNet support uh, DNS round robin? DNS round robin? Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. I should say there is a DNS deep dive talk, I think, at 11, 1150 uh, today. Mm -hmm. um, that would probably be a good place to go visit and check out for that question. OK. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, really want to use it uh, in my uh, OpenStack environment, and I also <coughs> uh, want to use, uh, uh, want to manipulate some other uh, DNS service, some like uh, uh, Google Cloud DNS or some uh, Amazon uh, Route 53 through uh, Horizon. Do you intend to bring it uh, to uh, the plan to add, uh, cooperate with it. Um, if I understand the question right, I think the answer is no. <laughs> um. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. All right. Sorry to be back again, but That's I fine. wanted to make a point. It's less of a question. Um, we have the same problem, by the way. If you're it, you're grabbing RPC messages that are specific to an undocumented plugin agent pairing. So if we go to an SDN vendor that's using Neutron that's not supporting the same kind of plug-in agent for L3 agent, those messages aren't there. Okay. So 
So it's just a little cautionary tale we tried to give the community last year, and we'll say it again. We don't have common networking constructs. We had them before, but because we have such varying use of L2 and L3, yeah. stuff like this, which is awesome, we have to do things like this ourselves, aren't possible without proprietary APIs in many cases. Okay, thanks. All right, is that it? Great, All right. thank, thank you. you.